That's 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. Likewise, deacons must be serious, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also first be tested. Then, if they prove themselves blameless, let them serve as deacons. Verse 11, the women likewise must be serious, no slanders, but temperate, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be husbands of one wife, and let them manage their children and their households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 14, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these instructions to you that if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Great is the mystery of godliness, for God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, and believed on in the world, and received up into glory. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 8 through 16 was read in your hearing. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 8, we're talking about the office, the official office of deacons. We've been dealing with a series on leadership, talking specifically about the eldership. I was asked this week to say something about deaconship. So this morning I'm going to talk about the word deacon, and tonight I'm going to talk about the office. But the word cannot really be separated from the office. Therefore, when we look at our text, I always like, as you always know, I like to look at the greater context in which our text is found. 1 Timothy chapter 3 is found in the context of the Bible, first of all. The Bible has an Old Testament, which is a revelation of human need, and a New Testament, a revelation of divine supply. An Old Testament, which is a revelation of shadows, a New Testament, which is a revelation of substance, according to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1, or Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1. When we look at the book of First Timothy, here is a book written by Paul, the apostle, to his young son in the faith, Timothy. He was an understudy of Paul, picked up at Lystria, Acts the 16th chapter. Paul is training this young man how to be an effective gospel minister. And so this book is written to a minister who is going to minister to a church. So as the church, if you look at First and Second Timothy, you'll notice that in those books, you'll find that the church has a ministry to the world, but the minister has a ministry to the church. And therefore, as the church ministers to the world, the minister trains the church to be effective in her ministry to the world. And in reference to ministers, the greatest school that a minister can ever attend is not Pepperdine, nor Southwestern, but it is the school of an older preacher. And so here we have the older preacher training the younger preacher. That is the New Testament concept of how ministers ought to be trained. We wouldn't have a lot of the problems we have today if ministers would go back to the New Testament and train younger ministers to minister to the church. And so here we have Tim Timothy being trained by Paul to minister to the church. And in ministering to the church, Timothy, you must, you must establish, you must organize the church according to God's mandate. According to the mind of God, you must organize the Lord's church. And that requires that you set things in order that are wanting. That, that requires that you ordain elders in every city. That requires that you ordain deacons. Now, when we look at 1 Timothy, the entire book, we understand why. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, let's notice some of the background. 
the setting in which Paul said these things to Timothy. You know, Paul didn't just get up and say, you know, Timothy, I think you ought to ordain elders, you ought to ordain deacons. There is a reason why. There is a purpose. I tell my wife, please, honey, leave the checkbook at home. There's a reason why. There's a purpose, okay? Okay, don't bother the checkbook. There's a reason why. There's always a method. There's always a reason for something being stated in the Bible. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, what does it say? Read it, Peter, please. As I urged you, As I urged you read, when I left you where? At, when I went into Macedonia, stay in Ephesus. I want you to stay in the city of Ephesus. Read. So that you may command. So you may command. Read. Certain people not to teach false doctrine. False doctrine was being taught. False doctrine was something that could have taken over the entire church. And so, Timothy, I command you to stay here and charge men that they not teach false doctrine. Read on. Nor to devote themselves to myths and genealogies. Now turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Okay? Here we have Gnosticism in its incipient stages being taught in Ephesus. In the earlier part, chapter 1, we have Judaism, a watered down, a, a, a polluted kind of Judaism being taught at Ephesus. And let's face it, folks, the church is in the world, and the world will always be in the church. You've got people who have left the world and come into the church with their world, so to speak. They've come into the church with their worldly philosophies, worldly ideas, and they try to tailor Christianity after their own beliefs instead of tailoring their lives after Christianity, okay? Now, if you look at the rest of this text, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils. And now let's look at the last chapter, verse 20. He says, O oh, Timothy, God, what has been entrusted to you, what has been entrusted to Timothy, was the gospel. That's the sixth chapter, verse 20. Avoid the godless chatter and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have missed the mark as regards the faith. Some have missed the the mark as regards the faith. The faith is God's organized body of truth. So Timothy, I've left you in Ephesus that you might charge some men that they should not teach false doctrine, that they should not plant seeds that will destroy the church. Okay? Now Timothy, one day you're going to have to leave Ephesus. One day, Timothy, you're going to have to die. One day you're going to get sick. One day a lot of things may happen to you to cause you not to be in position to minister to this church at Ephesus. So what are you going to do, Timothy? What are you going to do knowing that you are not going to be in Ephesus forever? Timothy, I want you to set strong men up to God and watch the church. Chapter 3, verse 1. The office of a bishop. Okay? The saying is sure if one aspires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. Now, a bishop must be above reproach, husband of one wife, so on. He must manage his own house, verse 4, keeping his children in order, and then he must not be a recent convert, or he may be puffed up. He must be well thought of. He must, uh, uh, th that he might not fall into the snare of the devil. And this, this bishop must also be apt to teach. You see, the word bishop means overseer, one who watches the flock. He is, a, he is analogous to the watchman of the walls in the Old Testament. Watching what's inside and watching the enemies from without. He is guarding the flock. And in order to guard the flock, he must know something about 
what the flock needs to be eating and needs not be eating. Timothy got it from Paul and Timothy's job was to set up other men who would have it from him so that when he left, the church would be in order. The church would be set. The church could maintain its purity in a world of heathenism. Then in verse 8, he goes on and says, Deacons likewise must be serious, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Wow. Now, from the background of this book, I understand why the requirements or the stipulations for eldership and deaconship is so is so high I understand it now simply because of the heresy that was prevalent at Ephesus and the heresies that are prevalent even in our day minister you're going to die you're going to leave one day leave some men a plurality of men who can guard the church against false doctrine these deacons were to hold the mystery of the faith. The word mystery is from the Greek word mysterion, which simply means secret that was hidden in the Old Testament but revealed in the New. Remember, the Old Testament, revelation of human need. New Testament, revelation of divine supply. If you look at this faith here, the faith, it says... Holding the mystery of the faith. The faith is God's organized body of truth, simply meaning the word of God. Everything that God has inspired, which is the mind of God, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses, or chapter 2, verses 6 through 13. So the faith is the mind of God. The faith is God breathed, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. The faith is the gospel, Mark chapter 1, verse 1. And the faith is... God's organized body of truth, Jude 3. And so deacons must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. The text is only saying deacons must be men who accept the word of God as the final authority in everything. Not their own opinions, but the final authority in everything. Then it goes on to say, and let them be tested first. Then if they prove themselves blameless, let them serve as deacons. They can prove themselves blameless by allowing God's word to be the highest authority in their lives. You cannot prove yourself blameless if you don't let the word of God be the highest authority in your life. We understand that Hebrews 11 and 3 says God's word created the heavens and the earth. And we understand Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says that God's word can create a new me. If God's word was powerful enough to move a universe into existence, it's powerful enough to move a brand new Kenwood into existence. That's what we've got to say regarding the text. I want to take for a subject this morning diakonos that's the Greek word for deacon diakonos and I want to show in this lesson the biblical view of the diakonos or the deacon and my objective is that many of you in the audience who are men desire this position desire this work and my objective also is that many in the congregation encourage men to desire this great work. Elders and deacons are needed to preserve the purity of the Lord's church. If you love the Lord's church, you will encourage men to this position. If you hate the Lord's church, you will discourage men. There is no middle ground. You either love the Lord's church or you love the Lord's church less. You hate it. You are either encouraging or discouraging. Now let's look at a few terms here. The idea of service. 
the idea of serving. That's where we get, that's what the term diakonos means. But there are several different Greek words which means service. Doulos. The Greek word for slave simply meaning or emphasizing submission. Therapuo, the Greek word for serve, which emphasizing serving a god or serving someone medically. The word therapy comes from this word. Therapuo or therapeutics, okay? All right? Latreuo, this is the idea of serving. Okay, this is medically. This is the idea of serving for wages. Okay? Serving for wages. And then liturgeo denotes service for people in general. If you look at Romans chapter 1 verse 1, Paul calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ, emphasizing his submission. You look over at, at Mark chapter 4 verse 24, Acts chapter 17 verse 25, we have men serving their gods in Acts 17 25. You have in uh, Mark chapter 4 verse 24, you have men, uh, Jesus quoting the parable of the proverb, physician heal thyself. And when he uses the word physician heal or serve thyself, he uses this Greek word here, okay? All right? And then lutreuo, you look at uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, the idea of serving for wages as the priest did at the temple, okay? Then you look at the idea of Exodus chapter 28, verse 35, the priest and the Levites who served in a official capacity for the people, all right? Serving in an official capacity for the people. Then we look at this word diakonos, and according to according to Herodotus, father of ancient history, the word diakonos meant one that served tables. He was a waiter, a waitress. When we look at Plutarch. He said this was a person who tasted foods for a king. He was a servant and he tasted foods. If the food was poison, he died. Okay? If it was good food, he said, here king, eat the food. It's okay. Then we... <laughs> when we look at the Greek mind as far as any of these terms were concerned, it was a humiliating position as far as Greek or as, as far as Greek thought was concerned as far as the Greeks were concerned it was not a dignified term at all ruling and not serving the Greeks thought was proper to man when we look at the sophist those who those who were great rhetoricians of their day who made money off of their argumentation they would fill arenas with people who came just to listen to how they would take no point and make a great point out of it. The great sophist of their day. Great talkers with smooth speech. They would talk you out of everything you had. They were great men, they were professional, and they trained others to be like them. When we look at the sophist, the sophist said, says concerning the idea of service, how can a man be happy when he is serving? A real man should serve his own desires with boldness and cleverness. Right. A real man should serve his own desires with boldness and cleverness. That was the Greek concept of service. Always have a hidden agenda. Always serve for the reason of being served back or served because you're going to get something out of it. And when you find out you can't get anything out of it, quit serving. How many people do you know in this audience who are sophist? How many people do you know, how many people do you know in the church who only serve for their own hidden agendas? 
How many people have brought that concept of service into the church of my Lord and have you manipulated people in the church of my Lord for ages? Think about it, folks. We've got men who talk good and will talk you into standing out in front, leave you out there by yourself, and use you until they've used you up. They continue to use you because it's something in it for them. That was the Greek concept of service. It was something to be looked down upon. It was some person to be manipulated. It was some person who, as Aristotle said concerning this word, he was, he was a human tool. Cicero says of this word, he was simply not human. When we look at the Jewish concept of service, when the Jews looked at any of these words, especially this one, they looked at it as a word that brought honor. They looked at both master and slave as a person that could be honorable in certain circumstances. It was not a totally humiliating idea to the Jews. However, the Jews looked at it as a great honor to serve God, a great honor to serve other men, but they also looked at it as a way for them to merit and earn things. Okay? Turn to Matthew chapter, or Luke chapter 18, verse 9. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. Okay? Okay? Their service led them to a merit system. Luke 18, verse 9. Go ahead and read it, Aaron, please. Now notice what it says. They learn from their service to trust in themselves. Have you heard people talk about how many times they come to worship service? How every time the doors are open, they're there? They give more and boy, they've been in the church a long time. Therefore, they have a right to have more of a say-so. Therefore, they have earned the right to be excused when they act ugly. They have learned, they have earned the right to bully others around and count others as nobody or nothing. This was the problem that the Pharisees and Sadducees had. This was the problem the Jews had. They served, but they had a hidden agenda. I'm serving to earn favor in God's sight. I'm serving so that God could look at me in a different light than he looks at other men. I am serving so God will excuse more from me than he will from others. They had what was what I call the PO. Performance orientation. Okay? Let's face it, folks. Our wife cooks a good dinner. We'll bring her flowers the next night, right? Yes. She performed well, just like a dog. We give her a bone, right? Okay, can we all say amen? We treat people like dogs, isn't that right? Okay, we treat people like animals. If they perform well, I will respond well. If they do not perform well, I will respond bad. Okay? Can we all say amen? And it's so dangerous with our kids. Because what we're doing is setting our kids up to fall under peer pressure. Okay? Because the peers say, do this and we'll like you. But all of their lives, we've said the same thing. Do this and I'll like you. Son, if you win the race, I'm going to call you the greatest track star and I'm going to brag about you all over the place. But if you lose, I'm not even going to mention that you run track. Okay? Don't want anybody to know that, that you are an athlete, son. It's an embarrassment to me. Okay? If you do bad, son, I'm going to help you translate that into I don't love you. And I only love you if you do good. Okay? All right. Luke 18, verse 9, read it. And despised others. 
two men went up to the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the, the other. The one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. With himself. God. Notice, he prayed with himself. He didn't pray with himself and God. Okay? Jesus is setting the book straight, okay? He only was talking to himself, okay? That prayer did not get out of the room, okay? That prayer didn't leave his head, okay? <laughs> didn't even get to the top of the top strand of his hair, okay? Read. Pray thus with himself, God. Pray thus with himself, God, I thank you. That I am not as other men are. That I'm not so bad of a guy. I'm all right, God. You ought to be glad to have me, God. God, look how privileged you are to have a person like me. I am a celebrity in your kingdom, Father. Father, do you want my autograph? Isn't that something? Look at the elegance that their service produced. Look at the religious false piety that their, that their service produced. It was the wrong kind of service coming from the wrong kind of motivation. Read. I thank God that I'm not bad like these folks. I'm all right. They're all bad. They need you. I don't. Okay? They need you. I don't. They need your grace. I don't. I've earned the right. I've earned my position. God, you ought to be glad I'm here. Negating the grace of God. That was the Jewish concept. Folks, we treat one another like that, okay? We treat one another like that in the church, out of the church. We treat one another like that at home. We treat one another like that on jobs. So basically, the idea of service that we have in our minds really comes from the Greeks and the Jews. Serve to merit. Serve to for hidden agendas. Okay? Jesus gave the diakonos a brand new meaning. Jesus gave the diakonos a meaning that said that this person who served, served out of the motivation of love. Out of the motivation of selfless, sacrificial, and in spite of love. Let's look over at Luke chapter 10 verse 40. Anytime you define a word, the best thing in the world to do is look it up in the Bible and see how the Bible writers use the word. That's the best way to get a good definition of a word, and that's what we're going to do for the next five or six minutes. Here you go, Luke chapter 10, verse 40. What does it say? Read it, please. But Martha was cumbered about much serving. Okay, Martha was cumbered about with much serving. What was Martha, what, what was Martha doing? I said Martha, okay. <laughs> what was Martha doing? She was preparing her house for guests, right? She was making sure that everybody would be uh, cared for in her house. All of her guests would be served properly, all right? She was setting up for the guest. And so she was, the Greek word there is diakonos. She was setting up for her guest. Was anybody paying her to do it? No. Did she have any hidden agendas? No. Hey? Was anybody forcing her to do it? No. She did it out of a pure heart of love. Let's turn to Luke chapter 8, verse 3, Matthew chapter 25, verse 42 through 44. Luke chapter 8, verse 3, what does it say? Luke chapter 8, verse 3. John the wife, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna and many others, these men were helping to support them out of their own means. Okay, you said men. The text says women. 
Can we all say amen? amen? Women. These women did what? Read it again, Mark. These women were helping to support them. Out of their own helping to support them. The King James says, minister it. And the Greek word there is the akonos. They ministered. What did they do? Okay? What did they do? It doesn't say anything about serving tables. It doesn't say anything about being a waiter or a waitress in the sense that we think of it today. But in every physical need they had, water, food, clothes, they served them. They did it out of the context of love. They did it out of the context of seeing a need and filling that need because they were able to. Can we all say that? They did it out of the context of love, not expecting anything in return. Wow. That's hard, folks. That is hard. Now, let's look at what I consider the coup de grace of all of it. Matthew 20, verse 26 through 28. I'm sorry, Matthew 25, 42 first. Yeah, Matthew 25, 42 first. Matthew 25, 42, what does it say? Well, I wasn't hungry. He gave me okay, now this is the context of the judgment, folks. Verse 31 says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and there shall be gathered unto him all nations. He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. On his right hand he shall set the sheep, on his left hand the goats. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed, inherit the kingdom, prepared for you, prepared of my father, before the foundation of the world. When I was sick, when I was hungry, so on. He goes on down the list. Then in verse 41, then will I say unto them on my left hand, depart from me, ye into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was never prepared for man, but it was prepared for the devil and his angels. Men go there by choice. They work hard to get there. Okay? All right? Now, then verse 42 says what? Read. Well, I was and you gave me but when I was a hundred, you gave me what? No meat. Read. I was thirsty, I was thirsty you gave me no drink. Read. I was a stranger, you did not take me in. Read. I was naked, you clothed me not. Read. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Read. Then shall they all ask him, Lord, when did we see you? When did we see you having all these kinds of needs, Lord? Read. And did not what? Minister, did not what? Diakonos unto you. The word diakonos simply means to fulfill every need that your brother may have. It's loving your brother as you love yourself. That's what the word diakonos simply means. Love in action. Out of a context that says, I'm going to do it because I love you. Not I'm going to do it because of anything else but love. Not because I know you're going to do it back to me. Not because I know that somehow politically it will help me. I'm going to do it because I love you and that's it. I'm going to do it not expecting anything in return. How about that, folks? Then when we turn our Bibles to Matthew 20, verse 26 through 28, the text that we used last week. Okay. <laughs> okay. Matthew 20, verse 26 through 28. Aaron, you got to read it, please. All right. He's talking about servants, masters, right? It shall not be so among you. Read. You know, the Gentiles, they lord over each other, but it's not going to be like that among you. Read. Whosoever shall be great among you shall be your what? Your minister. The Greek word there is the akonos. The great men among you will serve not expecting anything. Isn't that something? 
The great men among you will be servants of you. The great men of you among you will serve out of a context of love. They will serve you when you're sick. They will serve you when you're in prison. They will serve you when you're hungry. They will just serve and serve and serve and never a because of except love. They will be big enough to love those who don't love them. 1 Timothy 3.8 says what? Deacon must be what? That kind of servant, right? Okay? Right? Okay? Let's read on Matthew 20. Go ahead. Whosoever shall be chief among you shall be your doulos, emphasizing subjection. Diakonos emphasizes love. Doulos emphasizes subjection. The emphasis of love on the Akinos. Now let's look at our main scripture. The very next one. Even as the Son of Man came not to be what? Ministered unto. But to minister. And minister even till death. And give his life as a ransom for many. Let's look at the ministry of the diakonos of Jesus. There are a lot of people who don't want to serve in leadership capacities in the church because of what people may say about them. What some people may think about them. Can you imagine what people said and thought about Jesus? But in spite of it, he served. Remember? How about it, folks? Nobody likes to deal with anybody who is ungrateful. Okay? And Jesus continued to serve even the ungrateful. And when they nailed him to the cross, he said, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. He gave up the ghost, knowing by giving up the ghost, it would secure their, their redemption. He could have hung on to the ghost. Okay? And the entire scheme of redemption would have been scrapped. Can you imagine that? He allowed, he said, no man take my life. John chapter 10, verse 13 through 17. No man takes my life, but I give it that I might take it up again. I give my life as a ransom for many. Talking about the great diakonos. When we talk about the word deacon, this is what we're talking about. One who serves unconditionally. When people come into my office telling me, Kenwood, my wife is doing this to me and she's not doing that, she's not doing that. And Kenwood, I'll tell you what, man, if she would just straighten up and do this and that, then I'll do this and that. That is out of the context of Christianity. You have missed the mystery of the faith. You have missed the word of God, the mind of God. If my husband would only come home at night, I would keep the house straight. I would cook dinner. I would do all of those wifey things if he would. If Jesus would have waited on us, he'd still be in Jerusalem. Can we all say amen? He'd still be in Jerusalem waiting. If God would have waited on us, Jesus would have never hit the earth, right? He'd still be in heaven. I'm waiting to see some kind of kindness and some kind of beauty. And man, towards me, God would still be waiting, 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 waiting. And we'd all be lost. There would be no church of Christ. But because of the Akonos, there is a church of Christ. Because of the Akonos, there is salvation available to all. Whosoever will come. Because of the Akonos, the willingness of God to serve man unconditionally. The willingness of Jesus to serve and minister unconditionally even till death. That's why we have salvation. 
1 Peter chapter 4. Let's turn over there. 4 verse 7 and 8. Hold it. Will everybody get there? Okay. All right. Verse 7. I'll start at verse 8. Go ahead. Love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sin. Boy, oh boy, you know something? You know, I've, I've, seen, I've seen women in my lifetime that... Really, I mean, I, I don't see what anybody see in this particular woman because of her hateful attitude, disposition, and because she doesn't take care of herself. But I've seen some guy come along and say, man, that's the prettiest woman I've ever seen. Yeah. So I understand this text when it says love covers some things. Okay, <laughs> okay, love covers a whole lot of things, all right? I mean, we know that in the natural realm of things. And Peter is saying, let it work in Christianity. That's what he's saying. Let it work, let it cover things in Christianity. Read. Offer hospitality, Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Read. Each one should use whatever what? Let's say it together. Gift. Each one should use whatever gift. Read. He has received to do what? Diakonos is the word. Love covers the multitude. Love one another without dissimulation. Love one another unconditionally is the idea here. Love one another unconditionally. And in your unconditional love, take your gift that God has given you and minister, serve without expecting anything in return. They don't appreciate me. They don't notice me. My name never, never appears in the bulletin. Nobody has ever given me credit for anything. That's all right. God sees you. Okay? Serve anyway. That's the context of Christianity, folks. Read. Faithfully administering God's grace as what? In its various forms. Okay, in the text of the King James, some of the Revised Standard, also, it says that you are ministering, or using that gift as a good steward of God's grace. You see, when you use your gift to minister to someone else, that person is receiving God's grace. Because you are only a steward over that gift. And the word steward simply means that you are, in the, you are in charge of something that belongs to someone else. Okay? That's the definition of steward. So that means that the gifts that I have are not mine. They belong to God and they were given that I might minister to others. And when I would hold them, I'm saying, God, I don't regard you. And God, I'm not going to allow your grace to affect a person's life that is in need. You are an awful person. Okay? You are a person who have stepped out of the context of Christianity. Out of the context of God, you are an unsound person according to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 2. You are an unsound person. You are a person who is denying the faith. God's organized body of truth, you are not acknowledging God as the final say in your life, the final word in your life. Because you've taken what's his and, is, and you're treating it as though it is yours. And that's not true to the diakonos of the New Testament. Now let's go back to our text and look at our text in the context of this great word which will deal specifically with our text tonight. It says, once again, deacons must likewise be serious, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. They must hold the words of God in their hearts with a clear conscience. Then it goes on, and let them also be tested first, Warren. 
tested first. How are they going to be tested? You look around you and see people who serve anyway. They serve without flowers. They serve without compliments. They just serve anyway. Like I am to love my wife, not because of, but because God told me to, right? I'm to love my wife in spite of. If I'm going to regulate my life according to the word of God, if I'm going to hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, I don't have an option. God has spoken on the matter. I am not to hate but to love her. I am not to hate but love you. I don't care how bad, bad you are, how much you bad mouth me. When there is a need, I am to take my gift and fill it. Then it goes on to say he must be tested first. When you see a man like that, then if they prove themselves blameless, let them serve in the official capacity of deacons. Acts chapter 6. Let's turn over there. You have a ruckus in the church. The first church problem. Widows are being neglected. Of the daily handing out of hot dogs and biscuits. And verse 3, after gathering all the multitude together, pick out from among you seven men, notice, of good reputation. You pick out men to hand out hot dogs and biscuits of good reputation. Churches tend to look at certain positions and jobs of service as menial, as something that is not that important Therefore, we'll put our hands on anybody, and that anybody usually hurts the church from that position of service. This text says you don't ever grab anybody. You always grab somebody with a good reputation with the members. Or, or you grab a person full of the spirit and wisdom and appoint him to that duty. Folks, service is unconditional. Deaconship is a person that will serve unconditionally. They hurt my feelings, so what? They hurt Christ's feelings. She slapped me, so what? They put Christ on the cross. They put nails through his hands. You want to be great in the kingdom? Serve the kingdom. How do you serve the kingdom? You come serving and not wanting to be served. Your leadership is not going to be like the Gentiles. Your leadership is going to be contrary, revolutionary to the Greek and Jewish mind. There is no merit, there is no politics, there is simply serve best. I mean, wouldn't it be something if your wife called you a low-down, dirty dog and I never liked you anyway and your daddy wasn't no good, your whole family tree no good and you look at her and say, I love you anyway. That's what Jesus did and he says that if the church is going to remain pure, Timothy, if you're going to have a strong church when you die, Timothy, when you move on to another place, you set men up like this. You set men up who believe and hold, hold to their hearts a pure conscience in reference to the faith that is in Christ Jesus, God's organized body of truth. These are not because of men. These must be in spite of men. Wow. Deacon, great man, the diakonos. What have we talked about? Point number one, the Greek and Western idea falls short. The Jewish idea of merit system, performance orientation falls short. 
Then we've looked at the revolutionary Christian idea of diakonos coming from a context of love. That's what Christ wants in us. Every Christian should strive to be a deacon. But those who have been tested and those who have found, who have been found to be blameless, should be put in that office. Having the official task of serving the church. If there's anyone on the sound of my voice who has fallen short of being a true diakonos, anybody who has, you may have thought you've been faithful because you come here every Sunday, and you may think that merits something, you need to repent if that's where you've been living. If there's anyone under the sound of my voice who has, who has been a discourager of people aspiring to be leaders in the Lord's church, a stumbling block, you need to repent. If there's anyone under the sound of my voice who has not obeyed the gospel of Christ, you need to come to Jesus this morning by believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, repenting of your sins and being buried in the watery grave of baptism for the remission of those sins. Won't you think about this invitation as together we stand and sing the song of encouragement.